Welcome to the Science of Success with your host, Matt Bonner. Welcome to the Science of Success. I'm your host, Matt Bonner. I'm an entrepreneur and investor in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm obsessed with the mindset of success and the psychology of performance. I've read hundreds of books, conducted countless hours of research and study, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the human mind and what makes peak performers tick. With a focus on always having our discussions rooted in psychological research and scientific fact, not opinion. In this episode, we ask, can and should we set aside our emotions to make decisions in huge, high-stakes environments? How We look at how to channel and listen to your emotions to make even better decisions. We talk about learning from negative emotions, how historical echoes in our life create repeated behavior patterns, and much more with Denise Schull. The Science of Success continues to grow with more than 1 million downloads, listeners in over 100 countries hitting number one new noteworthy and more. I get listener comments and emails all the time asking me, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this incredible information? A lot of our listeners are curious about how I keep track of all the incredible knowledge I get from reading hundreds of books, interviewing amazing experts, listening to awesome podcasts, and more. Because of that, we created an epic resource just for you, a detailed guide called How to Organize and Remember Everything. And you can get it completely for free by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222. Again, it's a guide we created called How to Organize and Remember Everything. All you have to do to get it is to text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, or go to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and put in your email. In our previous episode, we looked at how Toyota turned the worst automobile factory in America into the best without changing any personnel. We discussed the paradox of choice, paralysis by analysis, and the danger of having too many choices. The vital importance of a multidisciplinary viewpoint to truly understand reality. We ask if there are any quick fixes for wisdom and much more with Dr. Barry Schwartz. If you want to get the keys to living a successful life, listen to that episode. And lastly, if you want to get all the incredible information, links, transcripts, everything we talk about in this episode, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. Just go to scienceofsuccess.co, hit the show notes button at the top. Today, we have another exciting guest on the show, Denise Schull. Denise is a decision coach, performance architect, and founder of the Rethink Group. She utilizes psychological science to solve the issues of mental mistakes, confidence crises, and slumps in Olympic athletes and Wall Street traders. Her book, Market Mind Games, has been described as the best of its genre and the Rosetta Stone of trading psychology. She's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, the New York Times, and consulted on the Showtime drama series Billions as one of the inspirations for Maggie Siff's character, Wendy Rhodes. Denise, welcome to the Science of Success. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're very excited to have you on today. So for listeners who may not be familiar with you and and some of your work, tell us a little bit about your story and how you got started and and sort of what your work looks like today. Well, I used to sell computers for IBM in my 20s. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, if I'm 40 and doing this, I'm going (laughs) to not be happy. Let's just put it that way. So I was very interested in psychology, went to the University of Chicago, where they had this really cool design your own master's program and studied basically neuroscience of emotion and neuroscience of unconscious thought, like what's going on in there that we don't really know about. And then I played volleyball with floor traders and they'd want me to be a trader. And basically I ditched the PhD and became a trader. And so I was trading, managing trading desks, thought I was going to be doing that forever and that that master's degree was like this cool little thing that cost a lot of money, but went nowhere. And then someone wanted to publish it like 10 years after it was written. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's neuroscience. If you publish it as is, you'll sound archaic because you will be. So let's update it. And what a group of scientists had shown, they're all at USC now, was that you had to have emotion to make a decision. And all of trading psychology and Wall Street psychology was take the emotion out of it. And I was like, hmm, if you took the emotion out of it, literally, you couldn't actually make the decision. This is a problem. We need to figure this out. So I basically started talking about it. And honestly, people started asking me to talk. And someone asked me to write a magazine article. And I really wanted to be a journalist at one point. So I was like, oh, cool. I'll get an article published. And then I think it took on a life of its own because it resonated with people. 
if people felt as if they were supposed to set the emotion aside and they found they couldn't, but they kind of were ashamed of that and didn't want to tell anyone, particularly traders. And so when I came along and started saying, no, 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 you have to have emotion to make a decision. And that's what the science said. Basically, people were relieved. And then, you know, more people wanted to hear about it. And here we are 12 years later or whatever it is with more people wanting to hear about it. So one of the core things that you just mentioned is the idea that oftentimes the, the sort of common sense advice or the thing you hear repeatedly in high stakes environments like trading is that we should try to set aside our emotions and and be rational. But the research doesn't necessarily support that conclusion. Is that correct? That's Yes, that is totally correct. And in fact, there's lots of different researchers who've come to the conclusion that the only way to be truly rational is to incorporate your emotion, consciously incorporate your emotion into the decision so that you understand what the emotion's about, what the meaning is, which parts of it don't have to do with the decision you're facing or the performance you're facing, because there's always a mix of what's here and now and what's not here and now. But if you try to set it all aside, that just all gets jumbled and affects you in the worst possible way at the worst possible moment. So tell me more about, expand on that concept that how do we consciously incorporate our emotions into our decision making and how does that make us more rational? Well, the first thing people have to do is actually just accept that feeling, emotion, thought, and your physical being are one integrated system. Yeah. And the best analogy I can come up with is a car. Like you need all the parts to have the car go forward and start and stop when you put the push the brakes and it doesn't work without all of them for the most part. So, and it's a continuum from what's called affect, which is just the best way to understand affect is the difference between before and after you have coffee or before and after you have a cocktail. That's the difference in your affect, kind of your general mood outlook. Then that morphs into what we think of more as feelings, where your intuition, unconscious pattern recognition is. And then extreme forms of affect and feeling are what we know is emotion. When you have this spike of an experience that's intense and is driving you to do something, the trick is to change your viewpoint of that experience and start to look at that experience as information, both information about the here and now and information about what got you to the here and now. And as you do that, start to pull that spaghetti bowl apart. Like, particularly, all negative emotions have like a kernel of meaning and a kernel that can help you. But because basically the whole world, been mistaught emotion and certainly mistaught negative emotion at this point in time. People never get to the valuable kernel or let's say rarely get to the valuable kernel. What happens is your psyche in trying to get like a piece of information to you that's important, that can protect you and help you, like and you try to set it aside, it's sort of the volume turns up. And so the irony of trying to set the emotion aside and particularly trying to set the negative emotion aside is that either the volume turns up so it gets more intense or it gets diverted and convoluted into other situations, including your health. So step one is just changing the viewpoint. I mean, people are really afraid of emotion and they're certainly really afraid of negative emotion. Men more than women legitimately because men are taught, you know, from conception probably to not have their feelings. Obviously, I'm, you know, that's not quite true, but practically. So it's an attitude. And what happens is as people start to say, okay, my emotions aren't something to be overcome, set aside. They aren't old from earlier in creation or evolution. They, they actually have value to me. Once you change the attitude, then you're able to have and hold those feelings. And as you're able to do that, actually, and be very conscious about that, you really have much more control over how you choose to behave or act. And I think I'll let you ask me another question because who knows whether I've, <laughs> what road I'm going down. No, no, no. I think that makes a lot of sense. And and it's something that, that we, we dig into a lot on the show and something that fascinates me 
which is this kind of core idea that we should focus on finding the valuable, as you said, the valuable kernel of information that our emotions are trying to send to us. So how do we actually sort of practically do that? How do we listen more to our emotions and how do we change our orientation around the way we feel about negative emotions instead of trying to push them down or fight them or avoid them? How do we actually learn from them? Yeah. So step one, once you change your attitude, so it's really step two. So let's just take fear, anxiety. Research shows that being able to be granular or differentiate between levels of nervousness, anxiety, fear helps you handle it. So one of the first things I do with actually my hedge funds and and traders and now with the Olympic athletes is get them to come up with their own spectrum. So on one level, it's one edge of the spectrum is panic and the other is overconfidence and choose their words like doubt, concern, worry, anxiety, fear, terror, and actually think about the words and even look them up in the, in the thesaurus, even though we all know what these words mean. There's some piece of, of psychological event, energy, and this is not understood yet, where using better language and getting the word right and even being able to use the words in different languages somehow helps us process the feeling better. So, you know, everybody's got anxiety, like, you know, on some level, you know, about a performance, about a decision, about their job, about their, you know, their trade, about whatever, you know, whatever, whatever anyone's doing, if you didn't have a level of anxiety, you'd never do the preparation. So, and then depending on how you've learned to handle it, that anxiety can be more or less in the most important or most intense situations. So in those really stressful situations, the more you can accurately say to yourself, okay, I'm really worried my boss is going to do blah, blah, or I'm terrified I'm going to fall if you're a snowboarder or in trade, you know, oh my gosh, I'm freaked out that I'm going to lose money. The more you can say that to yourself, own it, like connect head to stomach, own it and hold it right there with the right word that describes the level. The irony is the feeling contracts. There's something about that acknowledgement with language that seems right to you that helps you connect head to gut. And then it's like your psyche has said, okay, I got the message through. Like I know that you know, Matt, that you need to be a little concerned about this and so you need to go check X, Y, and Z or whatever it is, that you need to be prepared. I've got the message through to you. So I, you know, as the anxiety or concern in your head can now like go back to sleep because you've got it. I know you've got it because you've acknowledged this feeling that I'm trying to serve up to you that was meant to remind you that, you know, you need to double check your preparation or whatever the case, you know, whatever the situation is. I'm using double check your preparation is you know, covering snowboarding to trading to dealing with one's boss to um, being on television to whatever. But the, the clue starts with after you change your attitude, getting comfortable with the words, particularly around the spectrum of fear and anxiety. So concretely, what does this sort of connecting your head to your gut look like? Is it, is it journaling? Is it therapy? Is it talking to yourself? You know, for somebody who, who's listening to this that's struggling, what what would the, the sort of concrete actions that you would prescribe to them be as a starting point to really let those feelings be acknowledged and, and kind of let, let them bubble up and be understood? Well, for people who are comfortable doing it, which isn't what you asked me, you can do it just talking to yourself in your head. Like a lot of my clients you know, who've been working with me, I've got them to the stage where you know, they can do it in their head or, you know, some of the snowboarders I'm working with who need to do it in their head because they're in the starting gate. But the process of getting to that point in an ideal world, you've got someone to talk to about it, but it's really hard to find someone who can tolerate listening to someone's anxiety because we listen to someone else talk about their nervous and we want to make them not nervous as opposed to give them the feeling that it's okay to have that feeling. So what that leaves us with is journaling 
and someone being really gentle and kind to themselves and allowing themselves to have all of their feelings. I mean, because then on another level, they are really just a feeling and they don't necessarily speak to exact reality. And so the journaling mechanism, if someone can get comfortable writing on a piece of paper or typing into a computer, exactly how they feel without any judgment, that's the clue. Whether it's the journal judging you, you know, like there's a process where people will edit just when they, they go to write or whether the, you know, coach, mentor, therapist that you're talking to will judge you in some way. What you want is, is a feeling that whatever feeling you have is okay. And that step one is just to be able to look at, observe that feeling, get more information about describing it. So in a practical level, oh, you don't have to pay for a therapist, have a coach. If you can learn to use writing as a way to be that accepting other person for yourself. How do we get rid of the judgment? <laughs> yeah, that's the question, isn't it? You know, I want to say, hey, like, you know, it's just you and yourself and you're, you know, allowed to have all your feelings and your feelings are meant to help you. So what's the point in judging yourself? Like, it's just a piece of paper and you're just trying to, you know, understand how you what your feelings are trying to tell you what that message is about is it relevant to the thing i've got to face today or does it tell me something that i need to look into in general or something i need to understand about myself in general it's just research you know it's like and and i can tell you from my vantage point like everyone has all kinds of feelings and everyone doubts themselves on some level. I mean, it's just part of the human condition. Now, I've worked with people who have, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And a lot of people might look at them and think they don't have anything to be worried about. And they're no different than, you know, than the next human being. I mean, everybody has you know, levels of concern and worry because it, it is a driver well, understood in a pure form, it is a driver of what makes us better. In most cases, it doesn't exist in a pure form because, you know, no one's learned to understand it this way. So it's been mishandled. So then it's gotten exaggerated. And like, you know, one's whole history with fear and anxiety comes to bear, you know, in any given situation. And that's like the untangling part that you can certainly start to do in a journal. And it helps to have someone to talk through it with back to the value of language that's like i think not yet explained in neuroscience i want to say don't judge yourself of course i know it's you know way easier said than done but <laughs> i'll still say it like there's no reason to judge yourself like all your feelings are okay and it doesn't matter what they are they're just feelings and if you understand them you don't have to automatically act on them so this this makes me think about and you touched on something earlier that I do want to get back to, which is the the kind of integrated physical system of of the body and how it's all kind of one one whole. But before we touch on that, this this makes me think about something else you've talked about, which are these ideas of we have almost these historical echoes that create repeated behavior patterns. And I don't know if those would be the same thing as limiting beliefs or sort of related to limiting beliefs, but I'd love to dig into that concept. Yeah, yeah, they're very similar to limiting beliefs. So that master's thesis actually was entitled the, Neuro, the Neurobiology of the Theory of Freud's Repetition Compulsion, or Freud's Theory of the Repetition Compulsion. You'd think I'd know the name of my master's thesis. But in any event, Freud identified this phenomenon in human beings where we get ourselves in repetitive circumstances. You know, we, we marry one person, get divorced, get married again, completely different person, have the same exact feelings and the same exact arguments. You know, we go from one job with certain kind of difficulties with our colleagues or bosses. We get a different job, different people, same thing. He identified, that, identified this back in the 1800s. And I saw it in my friends and I saw it somewhat in myself. And I was like, why is this? Like, there has to be some sort of unconscious template in there where we're, we're, we're making choices and we're we're behaving in certain ways that cause situation A to be exactly like situation B five, eight, 10 years, 20 years later, whatever, 
30, 40 years later, even though the, the ingredients are completely different. So I studied that. I wrote about it and how like templates for relationships start, you know, again, from conception, you know, if not from birth, how there's something called a critical period um, in birds where if, if a bird doesn't learn its song at a certain point, it never learns it. And so I suggested that there were critical periods for all kinds of things, but the critical periods for who, like who we are and how we relate in the world happen to us very early. That becomes what is generally known as limiting beliefs. Freud called it the, the compulsion to repeat. I originally called it echoes in my work. I turned that to fractals, which I'll come back to in a second. But what I discovered when I started working with traders is that they would take the market and the prices moving at the market and the market would function like their boss or their spouse. And they like, like a Rorschach blot, they would you know, impute meaning to the way the market, personal meaning to the way the market was behaving. And then they would react. So like a lot of people reacted to the market as an authority figure and maybe would rebel and, you know, get bigger in a market position that they were losing money in, like as a way of rebellion. And once I started to realize that people were taking their life stories and their viewpoint of themselves and I think what you would refer to as limiting beliefs and like making the market their partner in this. I was like, well, obviously the market's not, you know, the market doesn't care anything about any one particular person. So as I started to write about it in my book, I actually realized there's a concept called, well, there's a thing known as fractal geometry. So like broccoli or trees are the perfect example of, of fractals, meaning that like one stalk of broccoli, when you look at it, really looks the same as a whole head of broccoli or one branch of a tree really looks the same as a whole tree, and it's just a matter of scale. Well, I started to think, you know what? I think human beings, effectively, that our psychology is fractal. And so we have these snippets of experience, you know, in our first 5, 10, 15 years, that then we don't know are, like, buried in there, but they are the, the DNA or the pattern for the tree or the broccoli in our head. We experience them is our self-concept as limiting beliefs, we're acting out of those. But what we can do to kind of unravel that is, un is untangle and connect those feelings to situations that might have occurred in our families, you know. And, you know, I could start down the list of situations that might have occurred in our families, but we all know what those are. So my opinion is that it's literally a neurological phenomenon that gets set up from some sort of critical period thing and how a human develops in terms of who we are and, and where we fit in the world. And unless we look at it, it just stays that way. And the mechanism for getting us to look at it is feelings that we have that make us unhappy in adult situations. And so we could we could try to set those feelings aside or we could say, OK, you know, this set of feelings makes me unhappy. And oh, by the way, it's the exact same thing as happened last time with a different boss. How do I figure out which part of that is me just bring this fractal echo experience that I, you know, that was kind of given to me or set up for me for, let's just say, because I was like the third old, oldest boy in the family and my two older brothers picked on me. So. I'm like more inclined to think that my boss is picking on me when he's really not. But until you start to realize, wait a minute, like my feelings don't match the situation, but my feelings do match situations I experienced while growing up. That gives you the awareness to start to be able to pull that apart and then react in the present with the factors in the present, as opposed to what you called limiting beliefs but I think are coming from earlier experiences in the form of fractals or echoes is something that people relate to. Like, you know, cause it feels like an echo, you know, it feels like what well, is happening again. I've heard this story before. I've seen this movie before. And so the, the kind of method or intervention to resolve that, is it the same kind of methodology? Is it the things like journaling or how do we, how do we start to unravel and reconnect those feelings and, and, 
sort of repair those those fractals from our past so that they don't repeat themselves? Yeah. So what I did for traders in my book was send people through a series of exercises because the clue is the way to do it. And it is helpful to have someone help you do it. I mean, admittedly, but having said that, if someone keeps track of the experiences they're having in their adult life that are you know, making them unhappy, I, and I'm using unhappy for like frustrated, afraid, you know, for, and like keeps track of those and writes down the circumstances and their feelings. And completely separately from that, writes, takes, like tries to come up with five memories from growing up when, you know, that could be from when you were three or when you were eight or when you were 10 or when you were 15 and write about those and write about what you remember what happened and then write about how it felt and then compare the two. Because virtually, if you've done that exercise accurately without judging yourself on either front, so what's going on here now and what happened back then when, you know, you got kicked out of third grade or whatever, you'll find that you'll find matches like it. It feels now like it felt then, And people are mostly astounded by that. And a lot of people don't want to do that sort of historical work. But you know, my attitude towards that is like if it solves like a repetitive frustration, difficulty in the here and now, why not? Like it's to me, it seems like a gift, not not a problem. So the short version is if you if you can figure out what's happening to you repetitively now and you can separately like not try and look for it, write about memories from difficult situations growing up and how you would have felt then. And that's that's a clue. Like to think how you did feel, but then also ask yourself, how would I have felt? And the, the reason for that is to get past that kind of filter of like, oh, it didn't really bother me. It was no big deal, which is what people tend to say. Think about, OK, if that had happened to someone else, how might they have felt? And then if you're trying to make the, the difficult feelings easier and more just more acceptable and like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like just, it, it's hard sometimes to admit that you felt this, that, or the other thing, you know, when you were 10 years old. It's, it's harder in a way than admitting it now. Because the way kids get through things, by the way, also is like to not feel stuff and to put things in boxes and to be tough. And so then those things get put in boxes and never get dealt with. I, I think the repetitions are opportunities to reorganize things that you couldn't deal with it as a kid when you didn't have any control over what was happening to you. And you really kind of had to set something in a box in order to function and cope since you were you know, at the mercy of the adults around you. But now you can unwrap those boxes and then deal with that stuff and then have it affect you much less in, you know, in your real life. And as it affects you less, even any amount less, you're able to perform at a higher level. I think that's a great point. And, and especially the idea of asking how would someone else have felt about that? Or how would I have felt about that? I think it, it helps short circuit the almost the denial of, oh, that didn't really hurt me that badly. That didn't really affect me that badly. And I, I definitely can see that in myself where sometimes I'll think about, you know, a struggle someone's had or something they've gone through and, and feel like, wow, I re you know, I really feel bad for them or feel, you know, whatever. And then when I think about, well, I've experienced that too. And I definitely didn't feel any sympathy for myself. And I definitely didn't give myself the opportunity to feel that pain and, and really be present to it. And I kind of tried to bury it under the rug. And so I think I love those, those questions and ways to frame it outside of yourself in some ways so that you can escape that defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That works all the time, by the way. Like even, I mean, always saying, like, how would someone else? I use that with my clients sometimes. Like, they can't remember how they feel or they don't know how they feel in a certain situation. And then I'll say, like, well, you know, what does your brother think about that? Or what does your wife think about that? Or what does your boss think about that? And people oftentimes will, or how does your brother feel about that? How does your wife feel about that? How does your boss feel about that? How does your husband feel about that? Like, people will actually say their own feelings. You know, they'll project their own feelings onto that other person. But you can do that for yourself, just like by you're thinking about situations growing up, like, well, how did my sister feel about that? You know, for exactly the reasons you said. So this goes into another concept that 
you've talked about, which I want to understand better, which is the concept of of creating behavior through expected feelings. Can you yeah. tell, can you tell me a little bit about what that is and, and how we can do that? Well, so the mechanism we usually use to change behavior is is some form of discipline. You know, don't eat that, work harder, you know, think like this. What works better is if we like let's just say just take working out, like, you know, okay, I don't feel like working out today. Well, I should work out, you know, I know it's good for me to work out. I promised myself I'd work out. I'm trying to be disciplined. If you think, you know, what will I feel like if I do work out? What will I feel like if I work out consistently? If you exchange the current feeling for the future feeling, it's easier to do the thing that you want versus using an intellectual thought-based directive. So like with traders, the market's really provocative and and if traders do things they don't want to do all the time, get into trades they didn't mean to, get into, you know, make their trade size way bigger. So getting them to think about how they're going to feel tonight, tomorrow, the end of the week, the end of the month helps them avoid reacting to the provocation of the market. And it's really just taking, like if feelings are essentially um, the foundation of our consciousness and the foundation of our motivation and thoughts really are layered on top, like working with feelings at the feeling level is more like working, you know, with the actual gasoline you put in the car as opposed to working with the oil per se. So it's just, it's just, it's got more leverage to imagine how something will make you feel in the future and that you want that feeling as opposed to you're supposed to do something because you're supposed to do something. So that's a thought like fighting against the current feeling and you want, you want equal weapons, so to speak. So you want feeling against feeling as opposed to thought against feeling. And most people think it's the opposite, like, you know, discipline yourself, think yourself and, and it works to a degree. And when it works, it's fine. But you, you really like, I mean, I get people all the time in the trading world. I mean, the reason people come to me is they've tried every sort of psych, psychology method, you know, and they still have this one thing they can't solve. And it's because they're just trying to use their heads to solve it. If they try to use future feelings, imagining how it will feel if they do or don't do this, then that's, you know, that's got some torque. It's got some power. with it. So essentially, if we, if we have some sort of activity that we know we should be doing or something we need to be doing, but our current state is preventing us or, oh, I don't feel like doing X, Y, Z. We want to project forward and say, how will I feel if I have done that or if I've achieved that or if I've, you know, worked out every day for the last week and use that, that sort of future feeling of, of positiveness to, to fight back against the current feeling of, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So step one is actually really truly admitting you don't want to. Like the same with the fear, like letting yourself connect. Okay, I really don't feel like doing this right now. Okay, I really don't feel like doing this right now. But if I did it, how would I feel if I did it? And would that feeling be worth, uh, you know, behaving in a different way than my current feeling? Because the first, the really admitting it and connecting to it in and of itself can, can dissipate it. Like, okay, I really don't feel like it. Yeah, yeah, but I should. And what I'm saying is the naming the current feeling actually can change the current feeling enough that the thought might make a difference. But if, and then if the thought doesn't make a difference saying, okay, yeah, but if I did it, you know, how would I feel afterwards? And how will I feel, you know, if I, in the future, if I continue doing this, I hope that made sense. No, I think it does make sense. So I'd like to, I'd like to go back to something you touched on much earlier in the conversation, which is the idea of the mind, the body, everything as an integrated system, and specifically around the notion of the inaccuracy of the the model of the triune brain. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's not a triune brain. Sorry, I don't mean to sound flippant. It's really, really common. In fact, it's particularly common on Wall Street and in finance. It's something called behavioral finance. People talk about all these decision mistakes we make and, you know, then they talk about this triune brain that supposedly is, you know, basically our thinking and analytics is the most developed and like feeling and emotion in the middle and the stuff that keeps us alive, you know, near to our brainstem and that it's supposedly developed that way. 
it's hard for me to say anything, but like no neuroscientist at the cutting edge of neuroscience believes that anymore. Uh, like children that have nothing but brain stem have been shown to have feelings, laughter, sadness, just as sort of one extreme example. But now not only is the triune brain essentially been disproven, the idea that you have one part of your brain like the amygdala dealing with fear. That's not looking so likely either anymore. And that different instances of thought or feeling are recruiting all sorts of different neurons and synapses across the whole brain, depending on the situation and depending on the person's history. There's actually a new book called How Emotions Are Made by a woman named Lisa Feldman Barrett, who she is an academic. She wrote it as a popular book. It's still fairly dense. But she lays out hundreds of studies supporting the, the inaccuracy of both the triune brain and the we have certain circuits for certain emotions and even certain facial expressions for certain emotions and shows, in my opinion, really convincingly that, again, you know, the system is more like a car and it's recruiting all of these different uh, pieces of functionality. Now, it's not like a car in that a brain might recruit different neurons and synapses for a certain experience on one day than it does from another uh, on another. Now, there's probably a reason for that where there's something slightly different about the experience that then recruits a, a different part of, of the brain. But the point being happiness, sadness, fear don't look the same in every brain all the time, even though you still hear that. I mean, there was an article in the New York Times saying that last um, when Tuesday or Wednesday. I mean, it's still definitely the conventional wisdom that we have a three-part brain and there's certain parts of the brain dedicated to certain feelings. I think um, the evidence is really convincing that neither one of those are true. And the good news is it means that we have a lot of like literally neurological possibility to work with our brains in ways that allow us to get different results. And for, for listeners who may not be as familiar with it. Briefly just describe kind of what is the conventional model of the triune brain, the sort of the three components and what, what each of their functions are. Well, you have this frontal cortex that does your thinking and analysis, and that's the most developed part, and that's the part you're supposed to be using. That's one part. You have this kind of middle part that's feelings and emotions that, you know, supposedly we needed, you know, back when we were hunting and gathering. And then you have the, the deepest, oldest part, which is in the back of your head, which is, you know, keeping your heart beating and your lungs breathing and your stomach digesting. And in that model, people tend to think that the, this theoretically developed thinking analytical part should be able to manage override the earlier two parts. And it's more advanced and you should be relying mostly on it. If that's not the model and all three parts are working together in concert all the time. You can't be expecting that, you know, what that supposedly thinking analytical part to be overriding the ostensible earlier, you know, more primitively developed parts. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. And, and, I, and I just wanted to kind of describe what that model was for people who may not be familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. So zooming out a little bit, but still staying on kind of the notion of an integrated physical system, tell me about the, the importance that you've seen. And I know you coach and, and deal with some high performers at the highest levels, you know, hedge, hedge fund managers, Olympic athletes. What have you seen about the importance of supporting the physical system itself, you know, the body, sleep habits, exercise, et cetera, as a component of mental performance? Well, you know, it, Sometimes I hate to say it because honestly, like if someone gets enough sleep and enough, enough physical movement, and I, and I don't mean too much, by the way, but like, you know, then it makes such a difference in a person's mood outlook or what, the, what we would call affect, attitude, like an optimism. So like with the, with a, the right amount, and you know, obviously it's not, a, it's not an algebraic formula, but with a good amount of physical activity and definitely a lot of sleep, your attitude towards something, your ability to perceive risk is so much more optimal 
than without it. So like, for example, when you know, a regular client who I've been working with who is doing well, like, calls me up for a regular coaching session and says, you know, I blew it yesterday. I like added to a loser. And like one of the first things I ask is, OK, like were your kids up at 3 a.m.? You know, were you up looking at the London markets at 3 a.m.? And you know, some large percentage of the time they end up saying yes. <laughs> But, you know, sleep is starting to be, um, as I'm sure you know, you know, much more respected and revered. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday about it being the new status symbol. But there's still an awful lot of pressure to, like, survive on not enough sleep. But, and, you know, just life in general and households with, you know, kids and dogs and cats and whatnot tend to, to keep people from getting enough sleep. But that physical basis, of, I mean, but that's what we are, right? Like we're physical creatures, you know, operating in, in these bodies that are, again, a bit like cars. And, you know, we need to change the oil and sleep is a bit like that. So looking at all these different high performers that you work with, what are some of the habits that you either recommend to cultivate peak performance or see repeatedly again and again? from peak performers. And I know they may be some things that we've already touched on, but I'm curious, what what are the commonalities you see between elite level performers that you work with? Dedication to getting better, like put putting in the work and the preparation, like regardless of what it takes. It's not about like just a raw gift. It's about taking the situation and the thing you want to accomplish and breaking down all of the different pieces that cause you to would would contribute to you achieving the goal and being accurate about that. People have a tendency, by the way, to over-focus on one piece of it, but it's the, it's the understanding the whole situation and like the competition being a, a, direct or a very important aspect of that. Like what, what is your competition doing and what do you need to do to perform at the level of, you know, at least at, if not obviously above your competition, that dimension, whether that's in athletics or in markets helps a lot. And then within that deconstruction of all of the aspects, a solid understanding of the competition is self-awareness and this becoming more aware of one's own baseline level of affect, feeling, and emotion and the meanings of those feelings and emotions. And when they spike, understanding what that's about and how to take the energy of negative feelings, particularly in the realm of frustration, like which could go to anger and figuring out how to use that to help you continue to prepare within that whole deconstruction of everything that you've looked at that will get you where you want to be. The people who do that, whether it's in athletics or in the markets, and that's, you know, you could call it a very holistic view. A lot of people do all of the pieces, but the social emotional awareness, like they don't really analyze what they're competing against. And they certainly don't get as emotionally self-aware as they could. And both of those are real levers. And on the flip side, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see high performers make? Oh, it's always just trying to set the emotion aside. Like to use that, you know, to use that thinking analytical part of the brain to set the feeling aside, like without a doubt, because everyone thinks that's what they're supposed to do. And, you know, in certain situations, the thing to do is say, okay, I can't, focus on this feeling now, but that doesn't mean I have to never focus on it. Like maybe I need to, you know, put it in this box over here, this envelope over here to be dealt with tonight or tomorrow or next week. But the, the general conscious setting feelings and emotions aside and unconscious setting them aside through like overactivity, being overscheduled or overtraining for that matter, not allowing yourself to have a minute of downtime to recognize the feeling and emotion dimension and to be back to, you know, pulling it apart, untangling it. So in, in one word, I could say overactivity. <laughs> and so the idea is that overactivity 
robs us of the ability to truly listen to our emotions and do the work necessary to remap those and get the leverage that you can that you can get out of a truly deep understanding and and being kind of in harmony with with your emotions yeah yeah you never give yourself you know you're constantly distracted you never give yourself time you know you, you like with with market people they're always analyzing the market with athletes you know they're always working out and you know there's this whole other dimension that it well it feels like you're not doing something you're you're potentially doing the most important thing to give yourself time and space to be more self-aware. So what is one piece of homework that you would give to somebody listening to this conversation to concretely implement some of the ideas and concepts we've talked about today? Resolve to allow yourself to have all of your feelings, even what seem like the worst ones, and learn to put a word to them to be able to say, I feel like really frustrated. I feel furious and then say about what, what's that really about? Uh, if you just resolve to allow yourself to know all of your feelings without judgment and then take the step of trying to understand what the kernel is, that in a, that has so many ramifications for overactivity and health and performance, and you're honoring yourself. Like I mean, you're you're saying that you're you know that you and your feelings and your experience mean something and they matter and they do, and everyone can do that for themselves. I mean, it'll be hard for some people, but you can take a step in that direction for sure. And for listeners who wanna wanna learn more, where can people find you and your work online? My company is called The Rethink Group. So the website is therethinkgroup.net. I have a blog. Granted, I haven't had much time to keep up with it lately. I have also done some writing over the years on psychology today. So if one were to Google me in psychology today, you'd find some older things, but still completely relevant there. And, you know, if you're in the market, Market Mind Games, you know, it's a, it's a pretty good book. <laughs> and you can't, I have had people read Market Mind Games and apply it to their lives outside of the market. So I think those are good places. Well, Denise, this has been a fascinating conversation. And, and I feel like we've really gotten to go deep into how to think about our emotions, how to better uncover some of our emotions and how they may be holding us back. So thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to the science of success. Listeners like you are why we do this podcast. The emails and stories we receive from listeners around the globe bring us joy and fuel our mission to unleash human potential. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at scienceofsuccess.co. That's M-A-T-T at scienceofsuccess.co. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every listener email. The greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes. That helps more and more people discover the science of success. I get a ton of listeners asking, Matt, how do you organize and remember all this information? Because of that, we've created an amazing free guide for all of our listeners. You can get it by texting the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222, or by going to scienceofsuccess.co, that's scienceofsuccess.co, and joining our email list. If you want to get all the incredible information we talked about in this episode, links, transcripts, everything we discussed, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. Just go to scienceofsuccess.co and hit the show notes button at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. We'll be right back.